Today on the Dad the Best I Can show. So I was a software engineer, so this is someone coming from technical background. I, you know, I would not advocate uh, even to my kids, you know, like that they learn how to code. For me, it's more about uh, because I think, you know, one of the reasons before I go into that, one of the reasons is I think, you know, coding will become increasingly simpler, and we've seen that in just in my. My professional career, so it'll become simpler. It'll still be needed. I'm not saying it's not going to be needed, but it's not going to be as、uh, basic as it is today, where you need a lot of people、um, basically entering in these instructions. So there will be a learning aspect to it. But I think you know the more important things are. You always have to bet on the things that are never going to change, and the thing that is never going to change is people and the way that they make decisions and their behaviors. Right? That has been true for、uh, all of our. All of our history, and so we have not evolved past that. And so I think those are the more interesting skills. And so all of the stuff that you mentioned, whether it's persuasion, whether it's、uh, how people make decisions, and how do you coach people, how do you、uh, communicate to them? Hey now, welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. My name is Rob Roseman. Who wants to be a millionaire legend? Chicago futures trader. Vegas poker pro. Now I'm a dad to three kids, ages seven, five, and one. Phew! Wears me out just thinking about it. Each week we're bringing on high-performing dads like you, entrepreneurs like Jesse Itzler, CEOs like David Cancel from Drift.com, athletes like Ken Rideout, best-selling children's authors like Zach Bush, to tell us your stories, your dad tips and tricks to help all of us make it through dad life. We have a brand new website over at dadthebestican.com. Go on over to dadthebestican.com and sign up with your email. It's 100% free, of course, and be the first to hear brand new dad guests and get weekly two-minute dad tips in your inbox. How else are you gonna keep up with the roller coaster that is dad life? So stop what you're doing, unless you're driving. Take five seconds. Go over to dadthebestican.com and sign up now. All right, welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. Today we are lucky to be joined by David Cancel. David is the CEO and founder of Drift. Drift lets you talk to your website visitors and customers in real time instead of filling out forms and waiting days to hear back. David. David and Drift have invented the category of conversational marketing. David also co-hosts one of my top three favorite podcasts called Seeking Wisdom with his boy DG. If you know David, you know he goes by DC. Hey DC, how's it going? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be on. And everyone does call me DC,、uh, including my wife and kids. Nice. Where are you calling in from today?、Uh, we're in our Boston office, so we're in、uh, Copley Square in Boston. If anyone knows it out there. So you were you're in Boston, but I was reading you grew up in New York in Queens. Is that right? Yeah, I was born in the Bronx, and then I grew up in Queens, New York, and、uh, lived in Manhattan for years、uh, after. And that's where I met my wife, who was from New England, and、uh, she kidnapped me, and I've never been able to leave New England since. You have to just watch them win every Super Bowl, World <laughs> Series, just、yeah. every year. Yes, I cannot. I cannot never leave、uh, Boston again. So yeah, whenever I whenever I think of Queens, my mind immediately goes to my favorite comedy movie of all time, Coming to America. Oh wow! Yeah, Eddie <laughs> Murphy. That's a great movie. I I I can only imagine you ate at、uh, McDowell's when you were a kid. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah.、Uh, actually, I knew exactly that location. That was a real location there. Oh yeah, they had the、uh, the golden ar- the golden arcs, not the golden yeah. arches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was actually a Wendy's, but、uh, in real life. <laughs> so when I was getting ready for our chat, I read a story、uh, about some rap legends you ran into when you were a teenager.、Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you tell us who you used, who you used to work out with or next to? Sure, sure. I used to.、Uh, so lots of lots of in the in the age that I grew up in、uh, in New York, you got to meet a lot of rappers, and so. I met a lot of them, but you know, I think the story you're referring to is that I used to work out、um, when I was in high school and then the beginning of college at this gym called Ferrigno's. And if anyone is familiar, Ferrigno it stands for Lou Ferrigno, who played the Incredible Hulk on a TV show many years ago. He was a world famous bodybuilder, and so he had this gym called Ferrigno's. 
And this is back in the day before Equinox and uh, Planet Fitness and all of these kind of things. Like you went to a gym, a uh, weightlifting gym. It was a hardcore bodybuilding gym with, you know, huge giant uh, monsters in there, both male and female, who, who were competing in shows. And so uh, myself and a couple of friends, uh, skinny little kids would go there and work out. And we got to work alongside, work out with and alongside um, LL Cool J, who used to work out there. And when we were there, and uh, Q-Tip from a tribe called Quest. Uh, so they both were, uh, were regulars at this place. Very tiny, tiny, tiny uh, gym. Nothing like the gyms that you see today. Yeah, that's amazing. LL is Jack too. I can imagine. Oh, did you did you have the nerve to go up to these guys when you were? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We would, uh, you know, we would have spot them uh, every once in a while on the bench press and stuff like that. But uh, you know, LL was massive. But in this place, uh, there were gorillas, and uh, and uh, LL looked pretty small compared to these bodybuilding monsters in there. That's that's a that's a really cool experience to get to see your heroes when you're a teenager, right? That probably. Oh yeah. So many of them. Uh, and so in New York, you kind of, that was one of the cool things. You got to see all those kind of people, got to see uh, rappers like Run DMC all the time and um, many, many other rappers you would see at different places and talk yeah. to them. We're going to ask you a little bit later, some of your favorite rappers. So be ready. Oh, okay. I'm ready. But, but I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing at Drift too, but you probably told that story a thousand times. So uh, yeah, thousands. as a a change of pace. The main reason you're on the Dad the Best I Can show is because you are a dad. How old are your kids now, DC? Uh, my daughter's 13, going on 14, and my son is seven, going on eight. So both have summer birthdays, so they're they're coming up pretty quick. Yeah, we got actually today is uh, I got a five year old birthday today, so I got to get my act together. Yeah. How many see, kids do you have? I have a seven year old boy, five year old boy today, and a one and a half year old baby girl. So, oh man, you're back. You're back deep in. You're deep in. <laughs> I'm in it. But I hear yeah. I, uh, everybody says, oh, wait till she's a teenager. And I'm like, oh, I got a few years. Let me enjoy this time. <laughs> right? What, yeah, is, my, what my is it like having a teenage daughter? Oh man, uh, incredible. You know, the. We have a bigger, big gap, so we have a six-year gap in between the two. And, um, you know, we were one of those, we were parents that, uh, well, we were a couple that originally got married and said, we're never having kids. We were that couple telling everyone we're not going to have kids. Uh, and then we, then we had my daughter. Then we were that couple for, for about five years that were like, we're never having another kid. And then uh, just one and, and one done. And the reason was because uh, my daughter was just uh, – is amazing and dr super driven person and is the perfect you know is exactly like me and my wife times 10 and she is powerful and uh she was hard as as a baby and uh because she always knew it wasn't until she started speaking and uh and was mobile that uh you know she she got a little bit more relaxed but she's super driven uh super um on point and, uh, and into all the details in a way that I, I'm definitely not. And my wife is a little bit, but my daughter is even more so. And she's, she's amazing. So we're so lucky uh, that she's a great kid. She's really into horseback riding. She has a lot of activities. And, uh, but she is definitely driven. I will say that, capital D. Does she have the same uh, entrepreneurial spirit as you? Is she working on some projects? Uh, more, yeah, more so, more than me. Yeah, it took me a long time. You know, I kind of stumbled into all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but she, you know, years ago, probably like three or four years, maybe almost four years ago, she started, uh, uh, she came up with the idea, actually it was three years ago, she came up with the idea that she wanted to start a bakery, right, to sell baked goods at the farmer's market. And, uh, and I, you know, I came home one day from work, she, t she said, I'm starting a, a bakery, I'm going to sell at the local um, um, farmer's market. And I was like, hmm, what is she talking about? And she's like, because uh, this came out of nowhere. And she was just like, can I come to your office tomorrow? She had never been to my office. And can I bring in some samples? And then I was like, what? I was like, wait a second. You can't sell like baked goods at my office. That would be weird. She's like, no, I'm just going to bring in these samples. And so I was like, sure. sure. And then uh, the next morning I wake up and I'm looking on the counter and she had multiple platters of, of, baked goods that she had done, you know, cupcakes and cookies and cakes and all this kind of stuff. So, wow, she called my bluff. That was amazing. Then I started to look around more and I saw that she had a printed out uh, menu 
and the menu uh, had, and it had on top of her, her initials and her, the name of her, this bakery that she had just came up with. Uh, and uh, all the things listed, the ingredients and prices along them. And I was like, wait a second, what does she do? What? I, so I asked her, why are there prices on this? And she said, oh, because I'm going to give away these uh, to everyone in your office. Then I'm going to do a survey. I'm going to do a pricing study, she told me, <laughs> to figure out what to charge. I was like, pricing study? I mean, she was like 10 or 11, 10 probably at that, eight, nine or 10. I was like, what? Where did she get this? Because I never talked about any of uh, work stuff at home, really. And I was like, what is going on? And I kept digging around further and I saw on the counter she also had printed out and made herself business cards <laughs> and it said uh, her name CEO and founder <laughs> of her baked good so that will give you some idea of who we're dealing with here yeah I saw her she's on LinkedIn already you got to watch out <laughs> <laughs> that's that amazing so, she, so yeah you're not you're telling me you're not even teaching her you just think she's uh maybe she's just modeling some of your behavior or trying to yeah. be like dad it's a hundred percent modeling. Like I try not to, for years, um, I try not to bring work home with me. And so I never talk about work at home, uh, be it with the kids or even uh, with my wife. Uh, we don't really talk about work. And uh, I kind of try to leave that at home and really just focus, you know, the, the precious time that I do have at home on the family and family matters. So I never talk about it. So when she was using words like pricing study and all that, I'm like, where could she have gotten this? I never talked about the, any of this stuff. So it just blew my mind. That's awesome. And it is, I mean, I, I, it's more than what we say. It's like they're copying what we do. So totally. along those lines, what do you think are kind of the important skills for kids to learn today? You, know, you always hear like, oh, you should learn a code, but it kind of seems like these softer skills like learning how to write, learning influence, persuasion, how to have yes. a conversation, these things are, are just as important, maybe even more so today. I'd say they're more important, way more important. So I totally agree with you. I, you know, I'm not, and I'm a, an engineer, you know, or, or at least I was a long time ago. So I was a software engineer. So this is someone coming from technical background. I, you know, I would not advocate uh, even to my kids, you know, like that they learn how to code. For me, it's more about uh, because I think, you know, one of the reasons before I go into that, one of the reasons is I think, you know, coding will become increasingly simpler. And we've seen that in just in my my professional career. So it'll become simpler. It'll still be needed. I'm not saying it's not going to be needed, but it's not going to be as uh, basic as it is today where you need a lot of people um, basically entering in these instructions. So there will be a learning aspect to it. But I think, you know, the more important things are, you always have to bet on the things that are never going to change. And the thing that is never going to change is people and the way that they make decisions and their behaviors, right? That has been true for uh, all, of our, all of our history. And so we have not evolved past that. And so I think those are the more interesting skills. And so all of the stuff that you mentioned, whether it's persuasion, whether it's uh, how people make decisions and how do you coach people, how do you uh, communicate to them? Uh, you know, one of the things that my my daughter is going to graduate from her school this year and then she goes into high school next year. One of the things that uh, we were most impressed with with her school when she went in in the second grade and we were doing a tour was that we walked around and it's a K through eight uh, school. And every single student that we met, uh, bar none, uh, would was comfortable coming up to us, shaking our hand, looking in our looking into our eyes and telling us their name and uh, answering any question. I mean, every of every age. And uh, we were, as you can imagine, blown away. And we were like, yes, 100%. We want our daughter to go to this school. And she is just like that. And so that's, that's something that they really uh, teach and encourage in that school. Yeah, that's incredible. And it is in a world of texting and kids that mm -hmm. can't even look up from a phone. It's like, I'm yeah. trying to tell my kids, like, even at something like McDonald's, when they want to yeah. you know, switch their toy, I'm like, you know what, if I'm not going to do it, but if you want to go to the counter and, and ask that guy and look him in the eye, by all mm -hmm. means, go do it. And they'll do it. And I, they walk back with a toy sometimes. And I'm all excited about the, the lesson that, I, you know, that, that uh, that's such a core lesson. Got. More people need to do exactly what you did right there, which is that that is a key lesson. I do the same thing uh, with my kids uh, and I have done with my daughter for a long time and my son now of just like they're going to have to be the one to go do it. You know, my daughter wants to um, go somewhere like, you know, since she's into horseback riding, if she wants to go on, on a trip that involves that. I ask her to plan the entire thing 
plan the, which I learned from my father-in-law. He did that with my wife and uh, plan the entire thing, come up with the itinerary, find the hotels. Uh, it's easy now because uh, she can book it online uh, where, you know, my daughter, I, mean, my, I should say my wife, when uh, she did it, she actually had to get on the phone and deal with travel agents, you know, at, at around the same age. And so I have her do all of it and plan the entire trip. I'm not involved in the planning at all. Yeah, that's great. And she's invested in it. So it's, it's exactly practical. Yeah, I was listening kind of along the lines of what you guys do at Drift, but I was listening to a, a TED talk yesterday and I cringe when people even start a sentence with those words. So bear with mm -hmm. me. But, but yeah, it was yeah. it was about how to have a conversation. And it was and they said it was like the most overlooked and important skill for young people to have today. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were just giving out some tips and I was taking notes like, this stuff is, you know, like you said, been around forever, but probably more important today than ever. Totally. I think you'll stand out more because it's becoming more of a lost art. And so that's even in the work that we do at Drift from the very beginning, we focused on copywriting, communication, persuasion, just like understanding how people think. And that has helped us stand out. Why? Not because we're particularly great at it, but because it's kind of a lost art. The, the, the art of actually having a conversation with someone is a lost art. And, uh, and so it's become an advantage for us. So you mentioned uh, not really taking work home with you. I had, no. I had your friend Sangram Vajre from Terminus oh, yeah. on the podcast. My buddy. He was, he's very excited to, to hear you on here. And he talked about, uh, you know, the challenge of work-life balance that parents struggle with. And for him, he said it comes down to like choices that you make. Like he said, yes. he, he chooses to Uber to and from work so he can mm -hmm. knock out his emails and his calls. So when he gets home, he can be present with his family. I know it's something, you know, even in our house, my wife's very career driven and we struggle with it. How do you balance it in your house and what kind of advice would you give other parents? Yeah, I think uh, I, when I, I copied Sangram because he had told me about the Uber thing. So I do something very similar uh, instead of driving or taking the train, which is uh, kind of impossible for for me, but I, so I, I actually get a ride into work and I'm able to get home and be present and take care of anything on the way. So I actually learned that from Sangram, which is a great, great, great tip uh, if you can do it. I'd say for me, you know, I kind of, um, I don't love the, the, the concept of work-life balance. I know what people are saying, but, uh, but I kind of like pull back from that kind of concept because I think, you know, it's, um, to me, it's about prior you know priorities and making priorities in your life and so i think about it more as like all of all of nature is ebb and flow right the sun rises the sun sets the tide goes in the tide goes out it's all up and ebb and flow and what you want is balance at a macro scale and so i think about uh you know there are times when i'm out of balance at work but there are as many times i make sure there's many times that i'm totally out of balance focused on uh, family and focus on what you know what I need to do there whether it means I miss a ton of meetings or a ton of time at work because I, I want to go to a school event or I want to be part of my kids doing something then that's totally fine and there's no guilt in either direction what I'm looking for is balance at a macro scale versus um, interpreting that as like every day must be perfectly balanced uh, because I, I kind of find that that kind of leads, or at least for myself, that leads to kind of always feeling that you're uh, never fulfilling one, one part of that and constantly feeling frustrated, right? Because you're because fo I focus too micro on like, well, I spent, you know, half an hour more on this than I wanted to, or that I think I should because of my balance. And I don't know, for me, I felt like it was an unrealistic way to live life. And instead, it's like, I need to be balanced at a high level. And, uh, and, I, and I prioritize being uh, even more so out of balance um, by prioritizing stuff at work. So, I, I mean, sorry, stuff at home. I will always prioritize stuff at home over stuff at work. Yeah, it's really good because we had Jesse Itzler on too, and he talked about it's okay to be out of balance sometimes. Don't overly mm -hmm. concern yourself. And mm -hmm. that guilt is real, you know, especially like my it's wife. Real. My wife gets kind of the mom guilt, which is probably yes. even a little more than dad yes. guilt. And I'm always like, look, you do your work thing. Like, I want you to be comfortable and focused on that mm -hmm. when you're doing it. And when you're home, be home. But don't worry about us, right? We, we, we can handle, dads can handle stuff too, right? 
Yeah, I, I've seen it. I've seen it with people who are um, who are so focused on it at a micro level that they uh, make themselves miserable and sick. Uh, you know, worried worried about it and instead of th- thinking about uh, that macro scale instead. You talk a lot about like cognitive overload yep. and it's mm-hmm. just like we can only handle so much in our heads. So if you're worrying about those little things, you're going to drive mm-hmm. yourself insane. Totally. So DC, you mentioned you grew up in Queens and mm-hmm. you talked about some things you learned from your father-in-law. I know you're, you said your parents uh, immigrated here, so they probably had a very different upbringing than mm-hmm. you did and different mm-hmm. than your kids are having. What's What's something you learned from your dad or your parents that, that you apply as a dad? Oh, my God. So much. I think all of my uh, major lessons that I think about are really come down to some early um, early lessons for my parents. Both of my parents emigrated here. So my mom from Ecuador and my dad from Puerto Rico. And uh, we spoke Spanish at home. And uh, I only spoke Spanish. I I learned how to speak Spanish as my first language, and I only learned uh, English when I started to go to school in kindergarten, first grade. And, uh, and you know, I learned that, you know, like most immigrant families, you know, my parents worked seven days a week. They worked every day, and that was normal for them, but they found joy in the work that they did, and they incorporated uh, us, and most, they, they worked for themselves, um, like most immigrants do, you know, um, and they incorporated us into their lives. My mom worked out of out of our home, and uh, and she was always there. They never missed anything. They always prioritized, you know, us. But they did work seven days a week, so it taught me, you know, work ethic. And I look back, starting many companies, and I think, wow, this is so hard. And this is I this is such an important thing that it takes me so long to learn. Is like, your everyone brings their own context, and uh, your context you know, can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. So like if, if you don't have contrast in your life, uh, and my parents provided this contrast because I can always look back and say, no matter how hard I've worked, I, I truly believe that I've never worked a day as hard as either of my parents. Like it's never happened, not one time. So that's a contrast that I bring. But a lot of people, including my own kids, don't have contrast, right? Like so, and when they have a, a very small range of contrast, of like what reality really is uh, out there and what people, how people are really struggling, um, you know, to raise their families, then the smallest thing can become a big deal. And we can give ourselves anxiety over it. We can worry ourselves to death over the smallest inconsequential thing because we lack perspective because we don't have that contrast. And so I always <clears throat> try to advise people to get that contrast. If you don't have it, you have to force yourself to get that contrast. And so uh, I'm sure wherever you live, not far from where you live, there is there are people who are living a, a totally different existence. And uh, it's easy to ignore uh, and, and go around that. But you have to kind of force yourself into that and actually see and help and be part of that community and see how people are actually living to give yourself that contrast that you need. Yeah, that's a good reminder because you always see, you know, go to the soup kitchen or feed the homeless, Mm -hmm. but you're almost doing it out of like uh, some sense of obligation. But right, just showing your kids that not everything is like how you grow up and maybe it'll make them a little more appreciative or just, Mm -hmm. you know, they don't have that context because we've never really shown it to them. So it's on us to to provide it because you grew up with it in a lot of ways that, you know, Mm -hmm. our kids are not. So it's a good reminder. Oh, definitely. My kids are far from it. And I think it's a, you know, it's super important to to make sure that your kids grow up with it and the people around you uh, see it constantly. And you need it almost as a guardrail in your life. I need to force myself uh, to have more contrast all the time. It's easy for me to live in my bubble. It's easy, especially today, uh, with all the technology and phones and all this stuff. It's easy for us to create our own false realities. Very easy, right? We we uh, follow only certain people. Uh, we get the new, only the news that we want to hear. Uh, we surround ourselves uh, on social media with only the people that we want to hear from. And in some ways, you know, uh, some of us are spending more time surrounded by those virtual, that virtual um, set of people than we are with, um, with actual people in our lives. Right? We spend more time in a lot of cases uh, surrounded by the people we follow on social media than we do with people in our day-to-day lives. 
Yeah, I think you even said on uh, your podcast, which I want to talk about here in a second, mm -hmm. that you're, you know, you've always heard this, you're the average of the five people you spend time with, so choose them wisely. And I think you mm -hmm. said, and it like was a light bulb in my head that maybe even more important today than the five people you spend time with, you know, in your office or at your family are the people that you're reading online or listening to that are in your earbuds. So it's like, if you're oh, going to totally. be on these things, you really have to be careful of what you're curating and avoiding toxic stuff and envy and all these things. So that's uh, one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of your your podcast, Seeking Wisdom. You guys are always, I'm not even in the B2B marketing world, but mm -hmm. I just like learning. And you and DG are like two of the only people in that space, it seems like, that make it cool and fun to talk about this stuff. Why Why is the podcast called uh, Seeking Wisdom? I know you're... Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I'm an avid uh, reader, obsessive reader, so I read a lot. There's one book that I come back to over and over again, and it actually sits, still sits on my nightstand. It's been there for years, and I reread it every once in a while, and it sits there. And it's called uh, Seeking Wisdom. And it's basically a a book that has lots of lessons in it, but it's... Uh, and uh, but a lot of the lessons come from Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, which I reference a lot. But uh, it's a great, great book. And what I love about both of them and the stuff that I followed from them for many, many years is that that they spend a lot of time thinking about how do people make decisions? Uh, how did how to avoid making errors in the, in their decision making, how to keep things simple and uh, and just basic lessons you know lessons i feel like your your grandmother probably tried to teach you most of these lessons uh, but most of us didn't listen and so these are these are the the lessons that you need to learn and we called the podcast that because that book has had um a big impact on me but also because i felt like that is exactly what i've been trying to do is is i am seeking wisdom i have not found any wisdom yet i'm just i'm seeking it i'm in the middle of it and uh, and I'm trying to be a lifelong learner and become what Charlie Munger calls a, a learning machine. And so that book is called Seeking Wisdom from Darwin to Munger. And it's re written by Peter Bevelin. Highly recommend it. It's a great, great book. Yeah, I was looking. There's another Charlie Munger, like Charlie mm -hmm. Munger's Almanac. That's kind of hard yeah, to get, but it's one. been on my list. Uh, list and I just have to pony it up. Like you always say, like these books cost you like $10 or even if they're $30, you're getting yeah, so yeah. much value out of it. So. Um, yeah, when I listen, I'm always fascinated uh, besides work and being an entrepreneur. It's like, how can I pass these lessons down to my kids besides sending them a link to listen to one day? It's like, <laughs> it really yeah. is like, can, I can't even imagine you didn't really have this, you know, growing yeah. up. I, I know. Yeah. And I want to talk about reading, too. It's like to have access to this kind of information and discussion really like, like i love that you guys just talk about it like in a conversation versus mm -hmm. read this boring book or something yeah um, it's really powerful and yeah I, I always wonder although i did hear you say you always talk about influence the only human beings that are impervious to influence and there are exceptions but for the most part are kids right <laughs> yes <laughs> so i we heard that and about, i was like uh, damn it he's right that, yeah we were talking about um uh, copywriting and cognitive biases and all these kind of things that we that trigger all every single one of us believe me all of us fall victim to these errors in decision making every single day none of us are immune and I said uh, we were talking about some of the different techniques that we see being used and I said the only people that are impervious to uh, this kind of influences are your own kids <laughs> so if anyone here knows how to influence their kids please write to me I'm desperately seeking uh, wisdom there uh, because all of these things that uh, work for us when we talk to adults, uh, none of them work on children, <laughs> at least not my children. I know it's, it's totally true. I try it. Mine are a little younger, but I did yeah. hear, I might have a tip for you. Okay. I can't wait. I James to... Altucher, who I also love. I love yeah. he, he keeps it real. He has a teenage daughter and he told me he butts heads with her all the time because <laughs> you know, like you that she's impervious yeah. to influence. Yeah. But he said he found a move, and it's straight out of, uh, I think, Cialdini's influence book. What is I guess it? he's a big believer in not going to college. That's like one of his yes. uh, things. Yes. And his daughter obviously wants to go with her friends and everything. <laughs> so of he course, says, he, he's a believer in not going to college. Yeah, he's like, exactly. it's a waste of money. It's a, And no matter what it is, he's like, whenever I would bring it up to her, she would just stonewall me. He's like, nope, Go dad, ahead. I don't want to hear it. 
So he said yeah. he actually like dug in and he found a persuasion trick that he used and he said it actually opened up the conversation. What he did was he said, okay, honey, you know more about this than I do. If you were me, how would you bring up this topic of discussing going to college? And that like Ooh, that's put it in her shoes and she's like, well, I would say that it's a lot of, and all of a sudden they were talking and he's like, it was the first time that like, he kind of cracked and he's like, she's still going to college right now, but <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it didn't work. But he said, you know yeah. what, when she gets older and she has like real problems, not whether to go to college or not, she'll yeah. be able to have a discussion with him. So I, I, I wrote that one down as like, I, I tried it on that. my kids. If you were me and it was 930 and it was time for you to go to bed, what would you do? And I, <laughs> backfired on me huge. But uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't work whatsoever. I right. love it. I love yeah. it. I'm going to try that. Uh, yeah. I've never tried that. and. Um, so my daughter is way too, too wise. I don't know. Yeah. Nothing well, works. Nothing yeah. works. It's they're tough. They're very uh, strong-willed. Um, <laughs> you talk a lot about the books you're reading and how impactful that is for you. But you also said you weren't always that way, which I'm sure a lot of people could relate to. It's reading is hard. It's not fun. Can you talk mm -hmm. about your mm -hmm. change and and what got you reading more later in life? Yeah, I think. Um, I definitely was, when I was a little kid, um, I loved reading. I had incredible love for reading. And I was that kid that you would find in the corner just going with a stack of books, just reading, uh, going through that. And then, you know, for me, and this is, you know, my experience, everyone has a different experience. I um, fell out of that love with reading because of my experience at school. Um, so that was, you know, elementary school through college. Uh, I kind of all of a sudden reading was being positioned as something that I was forced to do, that I had to do. There was no, re you know, I didn't know why I was reading, I had to read the things that I needed to read. And, you know, um, I am an entrepreneur, so, you know, I do have a problem, problem with authority. Uh, and so, like, that kind of got me, that, that I was one of those people that that kind of thing made me shut down. And so... I shut down and, and uh, kind of viewed reading as work. I didn't find enjoyment in it. And I, was, I felt like I was forced into it. And I think the way that we teach kids to read in school, or at least the way I was, I don't know how it's changed now, um, is just flawed, right? We, we teach kids to, you got to read from cover to cover. You got to read. Uh, when you start a book, you have to finish it. You can never stop in the middle of a book because you have failed if you, if you didn't get to the end of the book. Uh, we, we kind of encourage kids to look at reading more from a memorization standpoint uh, than an actual learning standpoint. And so all of these things I just think are flawed and uh, I think we teach, we do a disservice uh, to people. And um, you know, by, by managing people to test, the, uh, to, and test scores and all this stuff and, and then the end result is, uh, reading becomes not fun. And so what I stumbled upon a number of years ago, and if I could go back in time, I would change this. I would have started way earlier because there's so many painful lessons that I've learned in life that I could have, uh, the hard way, I could have learned easily if I would have been uh, enjoyed reading. But the, I started to question all of the, all different things. And, um, and one of the things I kind of stumbled back on was like, why do I have to read a book cover to cover? Like who said that I have to read books this way? Mm -hmm. And so I started to pick up books and I started to treat them differently and say like, okay, if I pick up this book and um, I get one lesson out of this book and only one lesson, is it worth the $10 that I spent on the book? And for me, every time I would come away with the same answer. Yes, 100%. If I can get one lesson that I can incorporate into my life and I can see a change in it and it only cost me $10, uh, yeah, why wouldn't I do that? And so I started to look at books more like that, of just like as tools in my learning process. And so I would buy books. All of a sudden, I entered in and said, it doesn't matter if I never finish the book. I, should, I don't have any guilt if I don't finish books. Uh, I will buy as many books as possible. And uh, we have a kind of unlimited book budget at, uh, at my house. And so my kids know too, like any books that they want, I will never question and uh, we can get as many books as we want. And if you saw my library, you'd, you'd see how many they are. 
and uh, and I don't have to read them cover to cover. I only need to get a lesson out of it. I can stop in the middle and restart any time later. So if I'm bored in the middle of a book, uh, and I might just close it, and I do this all the time, and start another book. But more often than not, I'm reading two, three, four, five books at the same time. And you mentioned James Altucher, and one idea that I got from him many years ago, probably like six years ago at least, uh, was this idea that he calls idea sex. And the idea is that if you're if you're reading different books or you're consuming content, videos, whatever it is, but you're learning different modalities at the same time, uh, all of a sudden, like those ideas come together and synergy happens and all of a sudden you come up with an idea that you would have never come up with if you just read one book or just the other book. But it was this idea of this confluence of, of reading two or three of these books at the same time that give you inspiration for a new idea. And so I really try to read multiple books at once and I'm, I go back and forth between books all the time and it's kind of transformed my love for reading. Now I can't, I read all the time. Uh, it's probably my favorite thing is, is reading books and, uh, and I kind of try to spread that, that idea through, through our podcast uh, to other people out there and it's amazing. I get uh, people who email me or send me videos uh, all the time who have just like uh, said like this uh, way uh, this approach has reignited their love for reading and uh, they've read they've gone from reading one or two books a year now they're you know in the last year they've read 30 or 40 books in a year which is incredible yeah, yeah you're really you're almost like you're giving permission which is another like influence yes. trick right you're like saying you don't need and it is it's what you're taught so of course you need to finish this boring book <laughs> and now you hate <laughs> reading so yeah i do that is a trick that i'd love to uh pass along to my kids because if you could encourage them to read what a superpower that they'd have i'm not totally sure how my kid's first grade teacher will feel when he's like <laughs> i read chapters one and two and i got yeah, what yeah. i needed you i know? don't need but, anymore yeah <laughs> but yeah, and I guess, that would probably I'm serve him that. well yeah i uh i got inspired i should have mentioned by also by charlie munger and warren buffett on this thing because you know they had always uh talked about this idea of like that you know, everyone learns through failure, uh, but those failures don't have to be your own failure. And the, the best shortcut and the only shortcut that I found is uh, I learned through them, which was to learn from other people's failures. Most of the failures that we have in our lives are, uh, are common failure patterns that happen over and over again. That should be of no surprise, right? Because we are humans and we have not evolved. And so most of the decision-making errors that we make are still the same. And, uh, and so you can look back in history and learn from people in history who've had the same decision-making. It doesn't matter that they didn't have uh, Facebook and the internet and um, cell phones and all this kind of stuff. It was the same errors in decision-making. And so uh, the best way to, that I found to kind of have shortcuts in my life is reading. Yeah, and I think the other thing that you said that kind of goes along with this is the picking a book back up because I know yes. right now I, I bought a few months ago that you'd love this book, you and DG, I'll put it on your list. It's Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. He's the guy that wrote 48 Laws of Power and all oh, these yeah. things. Yeah, I and have I just, it. I have not opened it yet. Yeah, it's the perfect book to like pick up and read a chapter. And, and when you reread it, I mean, I don't know if it's just the old man memory in me or what, but <laughs> it's like I'm reading it for the first time, but I have a little bit of a foundation, like this looks familiar. So rereading is another great trick that you guys, you guys teach. And I think oh, it yeah, even applies to a podcast too. I've listened to like a few years ago, episode 120. I must have listened to that, but I'll listen to it again. And you almost have like this confidence that you've heard it before. But now you can apply it, like like you said, idea sex. So yeah, I'm a big fan yeah. of rereading, re-listening, all these things. It's so important. I think, you know, um, that was another thing that I kind of stumbled upon accidentally in my reading uh, when, I, when I picked reading back up is that, that the con because I started to be comfortable with putting books down and then years later, you know, I had them on my, on my shelf. What's the worst case? You, you read halfway through a book, you put it on your shelf. You have a nice library full of books. Worst case, if you don't want books around, uh, there, uh, go to your local library and donate the book. Right? There's no lose situation here. But I picked up these books, and I was like, um, "Oh wow!" It was almost like a new book, mm -hmm. right? I was rereading. I was like, and the thing that I realized, and now I kind of really lean into this idea, was that I had a different context. And so, even though you have the same lesson, and you may have read the, this book before, 
now two, three, five years later, you come back, you have an entirely different set of experiences. So you bring a different context to the book and you can pick out new lessons that you missed the first time. And the best books that stand the test of time are the books that you can go back uh, over the years and constantly learn new lessons from that book. You know, we're so addicted to the culture of new that we want the new thing and the next thing and the new thing. And it's like, if you look back at those books that have stood the test of time, all the lessons are there, right? All the lessons you need to learn are in those old books. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, selfishly, I love it to learn, but I always like get excited that, wow, I can teach this to my kids, you know, not, you know, maybe this young, but like you'll have them in your, in your tool belt that you can pass on to them and they'll be uh, superheroes. Yes. Let's take a quick break for our dad tip of the week brought to you by Kickstart Reading. Do you have kids between the ages of three and six? I've got two boys, and when my older son was going into kindergarten, my wife and I quickly learned that we had no idea how to teach him how to read. We found Kickstart Reading and watched one two-minute video together, and you could see his confidence take off. Bonus, I felt like dad of the year. Here's another dad talking about how Kickstart Reading is helping his boys learn how to read. Hey there, this is Chris Heller, and I'm a big fan of Kickstart Reading. Each morning before school, I show a video to my four-and-a-half-year-old son, and now his little two-year-old brother is getting in on the action as well. I'm a big fan of the videos. Highly consumable and engaging for young boys. Definite recommend for all parents out there who are looking to get their kids off to the right start with reading. Kickstart Reading. Go to kickstartreading.com and use the code DAD to get 65% off right now. That's D-A-D, DAD. See? It works. Kickstartreading.com. Now back to the show. So on the on the DAD, the best I can show, we like to do one DAD tip. DC, do you have a tip for other dads out there? <laughs> yes. Luckily, you didn't ask me for a joke because I'm not too good with, with <laughs> jokes. Um, but, you know, my... My tip that that has worked well for me is that you need to choose, um, are you going to be a morning person or, or, an, or an evening person and really commit to that. And so I, you know, was always um, trying to waffle in between the two. And so I try to spend um, time with my kids at, at night after work or after an event. Uh, and then in the morning, and then I always felt like I was missing one or the other, and I and I had guilt from that, and so I decided I'm going to make myself I'm going to choose mornings, and um, and so mornings are my thing, and so I always make sure that I drive my kids to school, so I take my kids to school in the morning. I try never to miss that unless I'm traveling for something. I'm 100% consistent otherwise with it. That's my time. I make breakfast my, for my kids. I focus entirely on them. I rarely um, um, can make evening events, evening things. And so like, but I no longer have guilt there because I'm committed and I've picked, you know, a place where I'm going to be consistent in and that I'm going to prioritize over everything else. And that has really helped me. And so I've passed that on to, to other people, including Josh, who's a father of two here, who works with us at Drift. And, uh, you know, I've pushed him and we do these uh, personal goals for everyone in the te uh, team, you know, which are all work goals. And one of his is uh, that I pushed him on was to make sure that he's taking his kids to school at least as many times a week and to prioritize that over everything else. That's, that's really good. I'm going to when my wife gets back from her work trip, I'm going to pass that one along and she'll love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is like you said, just alleviating guilt and giving you yes. uh, some intentionality in your life is so mm -hmm. important. And parents were just so overwhelmed. So anything that can focus us a little and make us feel like we're checking the box, I think yes. that's really helpful. Totally know where to focus. And so I hope that helps anyone. And if you know, I'm decancel on uh, Twitter and all Instagram and all those other things. So if you ever want to reach out to me, let me know. Please let me know how it works. Yeah, I appreciate it. Can we hit you with some uh, quick rapid fire questions yes. that we do? Let's keep it, let's lighten the mood a little. Okay. All right. DC, what is the first car you ever owned? Uh, a Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Riding that through Queens. That must have been a sight to <laughs> see. That was a sight. What is your favorite dramatic movie ever? Ooh, dramatic movie. Um, my favorite comedy is The Big Lebowski, but dramatic movie. I don't know. I like, um, I have a, I 
resurgence with uh, because of On a Flight, The Departed, which is a Martin Scorsese movie. I hadn't seen it in years, and I've watched it twice on uh, on two flights, and uh, it really holds up. That's good Boston. That's in your backyard too, right? Exactly. <laughs> what is your favorite food to eat for dinner? Mm, I think pizza with kids. DC, you are a rap fan. You were raised in Queens. Who is your favorite rap artist of all time? Jay-Z, no doubt about it. He's all-time not, greatest. He's not Queens, though, is he? No, he's Brooklyn. All right. Okay, Here, along those lines, we asked Jesse Itzler this question, and he uh -huh. was so stumped he gave three answers because it, it was too hard for him to choose. If you could have a guest verse on one rap album or song, which would it be? Uh, if I could have one verse, shoot, one verse. I can't think of a verse here, uh, but I think I think it would be part of uh, a, a group that many people are listening would have never heard of, which is called EPMD. Uh, so it's an old rap group, and uh, I think I would have been on one of them their songs, but uh, I can't think of a, of a lyric now. Well, we'll take the group. Yeah, you guys okay. are just you're in rap capital. What do you got? I was looking up who's out of Queens. It's Tribe, it's LL Cool J, it's Nas, totally. Run DMC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My loaded. brother's going to be mad at me because I didn't say Nas was the best. He, we, he believes Nas, I believe Jay-Z. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about Drift. You've worked for several companies, but your current one is Drift is exploding right now. You guys are everywhere. You've got podcasts I see on LinkedIn. Every website I go to, I see the little chat pop up. Mm -hmm. I even saw your book at the airport. Oh, and wow. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Drift and maybe how our listeners could benefit from uh, checking out the service? Sure. So, uh, at, you know, at Drift, we basically uh, try to connect your sales team or the people inside your company with people who want to buy now. And so uh, we sit on your website, just as you mentioned, and try to connect those people who are coming to your website who are interested in your business with people inside your business, whether those people are salespeople or other people in your business. And so we are bringing, trying to bring humanity back to business and know that you know, no, no sale ever happens until there's a conversation. And so we're a conversational marketing platform to try to accelerate those, those conversations from happening. Yeah, it's very, very useful and it's fun, which is like something you don't get when you're filling out a form. I'm, like, oh, I'm talking to somebody. I do have an idea for you guys at Drift. I'll even be your beta tester if you All want. All right. If you I want a fun wait. little thing, if you can create a dad chatbot. So when your kid says, I'm bored or I'm tired or I'm not <laughs> tired or I don't want to eat I these don't have vegetables. Anything to do. The, yeah. the chat bot can like craft the perfect response. I will sign up for that. So all right, I'm on that. I'm on that. That is that's gonna take some hard AI. Yes, <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, being on the Dad the Best I Can show, DC. It's been great. And uh, thank. You. Where can people find more about you? Said uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Twitter and LinkedIn and DavidCancel.com and uh, everyone in the internet. I'm easy to find and uh, I have a round head, a beard, and uh, <laughs> my name is David Cancel. So you can find me. All right. Thanks, David. Talk soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you guys for listening to the Dad the Best I Can show. Go take five seconds. Hop on over to DadTheBestICAN.com and sign up with your email to get weekly updates, dad tips in your mailbox get your questions answered on the show that's dad the best i can dot com if you enjoyed it please subscribe and leave us a five star rating on itunes or apple podcasts actually five stars we could do better than that brooks infinity, infinity stars cameron how many stars infinity thousand, infinity thousand. you gotta one up them in this household thanks see ya